So, Gabor, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us. Um, so you're known as an expert in addiction, childhood trauma, mind body health, amongst other things. Um, they sound like different topics, but I guess your work kind of ties them all together in some ways. Um, could you give us a bit of a background about your journey and explain how you first became interested in the field? Sure, but in a certain sense, I'm an absolute imposter because uh, I write all these I write all these different books and I speak, you know, in many different countries and all these different audiences. I talk about addiction and child development and stress and health and parenting. Um, and I'm only saying one thing. When you treat children well, they're going to be okay. And if you don't treat them well, they're not going to be okay. And how I got into it was just a very simple message that anybody's great-grandmother could have told them. So the fact that this message is even necessary is a sign of the times. Now, how I got interested in it as a family physician. Um, you get to know people um, in their lives. You know, you get to know families. You get to know different generations of a family. You get to know, you get to see who gets sick and who dies and who stays healthy. You, s you get to see intergenerational and intergenerational dynamics. And uh, that led me to notice that who got sick and who didn't, who got addicted and didn't, who had mental illness and didn't, these weren't accidental uh, occurrences. They actually were causes in people's lives. And at the same time, I was in my mid-30s when I became my medical career, when I began it. By the time I was in my mid-40s, I was very aware that I was not a very happy camper. I had depression myself uh, for all the success that I had. I wasn't any happier than I'd ever been. And I had other problems in my own family, my children, my marriage, and so on. So I need to begin, I had to look at the sources of that. And uh, whether I was looking at my clients, whether I was looking at my own history and trying to understand myself, I got to understand that so much of what people suffer from, whether it's physical illness, mental illness, any affliction or addiction, relates to childhood experience. So it just, you couldn't help but notice it. And then, of course, I discovered that there was a vast literature on the subject as well, that, that, that people that study trauma, people that study child development, people that study the relationship of stress and health. And um, I began to look at that literature and uh, develop my own ideas and understanding. So it began with my own personal experience and my professional observations. And a lot of what you talk about, like you just said, is about childhood trauma. What's your definition of trauma? Well, trauma, um, it's important to define it, actually, because people use the word like God, and who knows what somebody means when they mean God. And somebody could mean a totally punitive, dictatorial father figure with a white beard, and somebody else might mean the essence of pure love in the world. So uh, trauma is, um, the, the origin of the word is from the Greek word for wound. So trauma is a wound. And how I think about it is, if I wounded you, if I cut your flesh, then the healing would involve scar tissue forming. And if the wound was great enough, there'd be a big scar there, and the scar would be without nerve endings, so you wouldn't feel. And it would be much less flexible than your normal flesh and connective tissue. So trauma is when there is a loss of feeling, a loss of awareness of feeling, and there's a reduced flexibility uh, in responding to the world, and there's a hardening that happens. So this is a response to a wound. And um, so trauma is a wound, a psychic wound, that hardens you psychologically, that then interferes with your, your ability to grow and develop. Uh, it uh, pains you, and now you're acting out of pain. It induces fear, so now you're acting out of fear. And so that, without knowing it, your whole life is regulated by fear and pain that you're trying to escape from by various ways. And that's what trauma is. So trauma is not what happens to you. Trauma is what happens inside you as a result of what happened to you. And trauma is that scarring that makes you less flexible, more rigid, less feeling, and more defended. Sure, and I've heard you mention in the past that we live in a highly traumatized society. 
how widespread is trauma in society these days? Well, if you look at the rates of overt trauma, such as uh, childhood sexual abuse and uh, uh, emotional neglect, um, uh, stress in families that traumatize children, it's, very, it's, it's widespread. The very few people really grow up fully untraumatized in this culture. And especially with the increasing stresses on people, the um, burgeoning loneliness of people, so there's less support now, so when they do suffer, they're alone with their suffering, there's nothing to mitigate it. This is a highly stressed and traumatizing society, and not to mention, uh, and you can't separate that from socioeconomic factors, with ne neoliberalism and loss of people's livelihood and loss of meaningful employment, loss of secure employment, uh, austerity, loss of uh, communion and communities. Um, not only are people more stressed and traumatized, they're also less resilient because resilience requires connection and communalism, communal support. Sure. Um, I think, as you mentioned there, and since having explored my own issues, yeah. uh, it's become clear that we all seem to have been traumatized to some extent. Um, what I want to know is how do you think the majority of people understand trauma they don't, and they how would you like that to change? Well, first of all, they don't. Mm. Um, they think of it as maybe a tsunami or a bombing by the Luftwaffe of, of, of Britain, which are certainly traumatic events. But that's how most people think of trauma, something horrendous happening. They don't think of it as an internal psychic wound that then limits their capacity to live as fully as they might which is what trauma actually is. Um, worse than that, the average medical student doesn't even hear the word trauma in their education. Uh, they don't hear the word. Not that they don't get a lecture on it, they don't even hear the word. Not in the sense that I'm talking about. They might hear of physical trauma, but they will not hear of psychic trauma, except maybe in the narrow field of post-traumatic stress disorder, which some psychiatrists do learn about. But even then, they have a very narrow definition of it. But trauma more in generally as affects the average person, that's not even thought about in the medical lexicon. The legal system knows nothing about trauma. So when all these traumatized people come in front of judges and lawyers who are there because they were traumatized, so now they're using drugs, or now they're act being violent, or now they're being somewhat antisocial, uh, and they're acting out their trauma, they're simply punished. Rather than the system getting that, these are really hurt people who could be rehabilitated if they're given the right support. So the legal system doesn't get it, the medical system doesn't get it, the educational system doesn't get it, the politicians don't get it. Um, it's a huge problem. Mm. And you spoke last night about how losing the connection to ourselves in childhood is responsible for many of our problems as adults. Mm -hmm. Could you give us a bit of an idea of how that happens? Well, when I talk about connection to oneself, I'm talking about something very simple, uh, which is an organism's capacity to know what it feels and to be able to respond with emotions that are appropriate to the present moment. Now, without that capacity, you can't survive. If an animal does not have a connection to itself, so it doesn't know what it feels when it feels it, it can't respond to a threat. It's going to be dead. Same with human beings throughout our evolution. So when I talk about being connected to ourselves, I'm talking about actually knowing what we feel and experience in a given moment and being able to interpret that appropriately. Without that capacity, we're lost. Now, we were born with that capacity. Uh, you never met an infant who's not connected to their gut feelings. By the time you, you talk to adults, you find many people who even have their gut feelings, they ignore them. So that something happens between infancy and, and, and adulthood that disconnects us. Now, what is that? What that is, is the need for acceptance by our environment. If our environment does not, or cannot support our gut feelings and our healthy emotions, then the child, in order to belong and fit in, will automatically, unwittingly, and unconsciously repress or suppress their emotions and their connection to themselves for the sake of of, 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 of staying connected to the nurturing environment without which the child can't survive. And a lot of children are in this dilemma of do I f 
feel what I feel and can I express what I feel? And, or do I have to suppress that in order to be acceptable, to be a good kid, to be a nice kid? And furthermore, if the parents themselves are not in touch with their feelings, they can't tolerate the child's feelings. It threatens them. Now the parent reacts against the child for, say, having anger. And the child learns, I mustn't feel what I feel. Because I have to belong to the, my parents. If I don't, who will s protect me and nurture me? Automatically, we disconnect from ourselves just in order to um, continue to be looked after. It's a tragic choice. It's not even a choice. The child's not aware of making a choice. It's an automatic process. And then we get into adulthood, all of a sudden we say, I don't know who I am. Especially it happens to people in midlife. They realize they've been living lives that were not their own lives at all. And they're wondering, why did I do all this? They did all that because they got disconnected. Now furthermore, you go into an economy where many, p there was a study out of Canada two days ago, 80% uh, of males in Canada said that they were stressed by their jobs. And so the economy needs people that, is gonna, that are going to do meaningless jobs with drudgery or circumstances that are really intolerable, but they'll put up with it. So that, that there's a confluence of the needs of the economy and the way we parent kids. And the more disconnected kids are, the more they can fit into the economy that doesn't care about human feelings, just cares about profitability and production. And so it, it's just a cycle that keeps going. Actually, so your new book, from what I understand, is going to be called The Myth of Normal Illness and Health in an Insane Culture. That's correct. Um, just how insane is our culture? Well, it depends how you want to define sanity. So. Um, um, if you look at sanity as uh, something that's congruent with human nature and human needs, never mind nature, just look at human needs, and human needs for meaning and connection and validation and belonging and transcendence, these are human needs. This society is insane because it utterly tramples, it tramples on those human needs. And that's what makes it insane. And so that when somebody's normal in the society, they're conforming to an insane standard. Hence the title of the myth of normal. Um, so that's, that's what the next book is about. I'm writing another book, by the way, with my son. It'll be entitled Hello Again, A Fresh Start for Adult Children and Their Parents. Because, I mean, to look at our relationship, very often adult parent-child relationships are so fractured, by the time we become adults, we don't know how to even relate to our parents, or our parents to us for that matter. So that book is about bridging that intergenerational gap and, 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 and helping each generation take 100% responsibility for their role in the, uh, in the dynamic. So first I'm writing the book, uh, uh, The Myth of Normal, and then that book on connecting adult children with their parents. I just wanted to get your opinion on something that has affected a few friends of mine recently. Sure. So some of my close friends have struggled with anxiety and panic attacks. These are guys in their late 20s, early 30s. Right. right. Um, I just wanted your opinion on whether you think this is always rooted in childhood and is there any practical advice you'd give to someone who's sure. Um, sure. trying to get to the root of it? Sure. So in general, I believe that most mental health disorders, in fact, I would say almost every mental health disorder originates in childhood experience and it originates as a coping mechanism. Now, if you look at anxiety, if I were to pull a gun on you, you would not be anxious. You'd be afraid, as you should be. So when are we afraid? When we're threatened with something either something bad happened to us or something that we perceive as we need, as something that we need is threatened to be taken away from us. Now, in the early child's life, in the young, in, in the young child's early life, anxiety is an attachment alarm. What is the child's biggest need? Attachment with the parent, connection with the parent. When the parent's not around, the child should feel some fear. That serves a positive purpose, because when the child feels fear, he cries. 
she vocalizes, and that brings the parent. I mean, look at a mother cat responding to the kitten's cries, you know, immediate. And the same with instinct, with, with, with human beings who are still connected to the parenting, inst parenting instinct, they will respond to the child's cry for help. So that fear is adaptive. So it's, co it's a coping mechanism. But now what happens to a person whose parents are taught by medical experts, like I used to, until I learned otherwise, or others, not to pick up the kids when they're crying? Now that natural fear that causes the crying, that brings the parent, which ends the anxiety, is embedded in the child. So what begins as a coping mechanism now becomes generalized. So under certain circumstances, there should be fear and anxiety. But when I have this anxiety, when there's no immediate threat, what is that about? It's not a response to ex anything external. It's the embedded anxiety that I de developed as a child. Now, in a society that makes people more isolated all the time, that, that where, where, where human social contact is replaced by the rather cold and, and um, impersonal world of the internet. And when people are under genuine threat, where, where young people have less opportunity for meaningful employment and belonging and a sense of purpose th than, they than their parents used to, there's g more general threat. Now when that general threat hits people who are in childhood, over immersed in anxiety that's not relieved by the parent coming to help them, now you've got an anxiety situation. So when it comes to your friends with anxiety, I would um, get them to really look at their childhoods and to recognize that that anxiety is really the cry of some desperate childhood part of themselves for help and, and to learn to get help with that part. Not, to, not just to take tranquilizers or to drink booze, not to feel the anxiety or not to go on the internet to, to soothe themselves or to uh, escape momentarily, but to actually see that that anxiety is a normal response on their part to what actually happened to them, and that it can be relieved and recovered from if they look at its sources. Great. And um, what advice would you give to someone who's just kind of waking up to some of the things you're talking about, to their own issues, and beginning to explore the root of them? Uh, continue. Continue. Uh, you know, I, uh, I often tell this to people. I've, I've written my own. It's an ongoing journey, you know, as I'm sure you know for yourself. Um, but I've written my epitaph. So carved on my gravestone, it's going to say, it was a lot more work than, it, uh, than I anticipated. <laughs> and it's a lot of work. But it's necessary work, and actually it's beautiful work, because it actually puts you into your life in a real way. And it, it enriches your relationships and, and capacity to create. So the more you get to know yourself, the, the freer you are. And that's why Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the, tru the truth will free you. Well, Jesus also said, he's a great psychologist, as were all the great spiritual masters. He also said in the Gospel of Thomas is that um, whatever you bring out of yourself, will free you, and whatever you don't bring out of yourself will actually kill you. I'm, those are, I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. So all the stuff that we're carrying, unpleasant and scary, and, 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 and as much as we may judge ourselves for having these issues, if we approach ourselves with some real genuine curiosity of, okay, what is this really all about, and, and, and with some compassion, um, it can be tremendously liberating. So if you've begun that, Continue it. And there are many paths. Also, honor your body. So make sure you eat well, obviously, and, and uh, that you get out into nature and you exercise. Do body work like yoga or other, or martial arts or Tai Chi or Qigong or any number of body based practices. Um, so, you know align with your psyche with your body and get to know them both. I took part in my first few ayahuasca ceremonies earlier this year. Yeah. Um, 
and like I mentioned earlier, they're very helpful for me in just pointing me in the right direction. Um, could you give us a bit of background about your work with plant medicine and the role you think it can play? Sure. So ayahuasca specifically is a plant that grows in the Amazon basin in Peru, Colombia, Brazil, and Ecuador. The shamans there, of, of different ethnic backgrounds, by the way, have, uh, but, but native backgrounds, have been using the plant for at least hundreds, possibly a thousand years or more, in ceremonial contexts as a healing agent. And uh, the plant, or ayahuasca, which is really a combination of two plants, which are boiled and mixed together by the shamans, um, has the capacity, and this has been shown on brain scans, to uh, open up areas of the brain that carry childhood emotional memories and also adult insight. So uh, to put it in a very simplistic nutshell, under the proper circumstances, when you do the ayahuasca, you can relive or revision your childhood experience with the insight of an adult. Um, you may experience visions along the way. I don't much, by the way. I, uh, I wish I did. I wish some jaguars would come and talk to me, but so far they haven't. Or anacondas, you know, <laughs> or whatever people see. Birds of paradise, you know. Angels, anything, please. But no, I don't get that stuff, you know. Um, but a lot of people do. Those always have a meaning. And that meaning is not magical. The meaning has to do with some dynamic within yourself. So the jaguar or the anaconda becomes a symbol for your something inside yourself and, and, your, and, and, and how that connects to nature as well. Because we come from nature, we're part of nature, and certainly in the Amazon, people very much are related to nature. So through these visions, through these childhood emotional states, through the joy and the unity and the bliss and the oneness or the fear and the terror and the pain, you get to know your true nature and you get to make friends with it. And you get to accompany that with the inside of the adult. That's kind of a romanticized, somewhat romanticized version of what happens. Sometimes all you do is get a stomach ache and you throw up. And uh, it can be very difficult indeed for some people to go through a night sometimes with fears and terrors arising in them. But in the right context, with the right support and the right guidance, they can be deeply meaningful experiences, and maybe as you would verify yourself, it's not unusual to hear somebody say, well, that night or that week, those three ceremonies gave me more than 10 years of psychotherapy ever had. And, and I get that all the time. No, they're not for everybody, and you're either called by it or you're not called by it. Called by it. Nobody should force themselves. Certain people should not do them. Uh, certain medications are incompatible with it. But for a lot of people, they can be profound journeys into the soul. Mm. And um, one, one other question I had, mm -hmm. it's kind of specific. Um, I know a few people who, uh, a few women who have recently been diagnosed with things such as endometriosis, yeah. fibromyalgia. Yeah. Um, again, would you say these kind of things are rooted in childhood development? Only 100% of the time. Um, if, if, you t if you actually talk to the, these women with fibromyalgia uh, or endometriosis, um, these are physiological processes, but we know from science and intuition, but a lot of science as well, I have to say, that the mind and body can't be separated. Um, these people invariably suffer from severe stress. Those stresses have to do with suppressing the self that actually began in childhood as a coping mechanism along the lines that we're talking about. I've known people who've healed themselves from fibromyalgia, endometriosis, and even more threatening conditions simply by, not simply, it's not simple, but, but through the process of deep self-work with the appropriate support. So um, for those people suffering from endometriosis or fibromyalgia, I really urge them to read my book when the body says no, because my contention is that their disease, so-called, is actually the body saying no to stresses in their lives that they haven't said no to. So I would invite them to look at their relationships, for example, with their partners. How much of your partner's stress do you take on? How much of a people pleaser are you? Are you? How nice are you to people, no matter how you feel? How much do you take on the problems of other people and ignore your own? Um, 
how well do you know yourself? And when they start, where are you not saying no in your life, where you want to say no, but you're afraid to, because you're afraid of rejection, or not being loved, or not being a good person. And if they engage with those questions, their bodies will respond very positively. It's great, great advice. Um, I think just to start wrapping things up now, I've got one question that I've, that I've been asking yeah. everyone I've been interviewing. Sure. Um, it's very simple. If you could go back knowing what you'd know now, what advice would you give to your 18-year-old self? Hmm. It's to, to focus internally. As an 18-year-old, um, I was very focused on fixing the world. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it was also an escape from tremendous distress that I was carrying inside, but I wasn't looking at it. So, um, I'm with Socrates. He said, the unexamined world, life is not worth living. Uh, <laughs> which is true. So I would say, um, know, your, know yourself, get to know yourself. And, 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 and combine that curiosity about, curiosity about yourself with, and curiosity means that you really don't know, that you're really open to finding out, and that you're open to any kind of outcome. That's what curiosity means. That takes a lot, because people are afraid of what they will find. You know, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton both said that they don't want psychotherapy because they don't want to find out stuff about themselves that they're afraid of. It's so I say to my 18-year-old self, relax. The world is benign. It'll support you. You just need to support yourself. Get to know yourself and put as much attention on yourself. Put as much attention internally, not on your selfish needs, but on your real needs. And, and your real self, as you do on the outside. So don't neglect the one for the other. That's what I would say to my 18-year-old self. Great, thank you. And just very quickly, where's the best place for someone to find out more about your work and perhaps buy your books? Well, the books are available in bookstores. They're published in Britain now for the first time, and apparently they're selling quite well. Um, Britain was the last major country, I think, to discover me, which I'm glad. Uh, uh, they're also available on Amazon. In terms of my own work, I have a website, just my name, Dr. Gabor Mate. Dozens of my lectures have been filmed by people and put on YouTube, seen by many people. They don't cost anything. There's no channel you have to subscribe to. Just Google my name on YouTube and you'll find talks on any number of subjects, including many of the topics that you and I have discussed. So it's very easy to find me on the, on the internet and, and at my website. Um, I give an online course now called Compassionate Inquiry, which is a deep dive into the self. That's mostly for people that work with people, therapists and so on. But there'll, there'll be a layperson's version of it available for relatively inexpensive cost in a few months. It's called Compassionate Inquiry. Um, so it's easy to find me, it's easy to find my work. And I'm really unfortunate to say that even if uh, I should find myself disabled from working or or, or, or demi suffered my demise, there's enough of my work out there that people can find it and we'll be able to find it for a long time. Mm. Great, well Gabor, thanks so much for your time, really appreciate it. My great pleasure, thank you. Thank you.